So braving the second polar vortex of the winter, I hope that um, I will make this worth your time this evening and impart just a little bit of some knowledge. Um, my name is Iva Statz. Um, I am the director of physical therapy here for Wright State Physicians. Um, I've been in that position since July of 2012. Um, I kind of chuckle a little bit at being the director of our department right now because we are a department of two. So I direct myself and, and one other. We are growing consistently and exponentially, so we are not going to be two for very long. I manage myself for about the first year. Um, I have about 18 years of physical therapy experience, about 17 and a half of those in outpatient orthopedic sports medicine um, and industrial rehab. So this topic in particular is particularly close to my heart. I've preached it, talked about it. Um, one of our very important roles is in preventing injury when we can. There's, there's enough to go around. This isn't uh, going to keep me from, from any business. People will continue to do kind of dumb things. Okay. Um, I graduated from Miami in a long time ago uh, with my undergraduate degree and then went on to physical therapy school at OU, um, which in the MAC conference is a little bit like leaving Ohio State to go to Michigan. Um, I had to swallow my pride a little bit. I married a Bob Kitty, though, um, while I was there. Other than that, he's a really nice guy. Um, okay. Just like the outside of the McDonald's cup, I have to tell you the contents are hot. Don't spill them in your lap, you might burn yourself. Okay? Um, obviously nothing in the content of the presentation this evening is intended to be taken as medical advice, diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's for informational purposes only. Okay. All right. I've told you enough about myself. I'm going to ask a little bit about you now. How many here have suffered from back pain at some point? About 80 percent, thereabouts. How many people have suffered from back pain that have caused them to miss an activity that they enjoy or work or made them go see a doctor? About what I would expect. Okay. How many people here lift any significant amount of weight while they are at work? 25 pounds or more on a regular basis. 50 pounds or more on a regular basis. Okay. Um, how many people here sit at a computer more than six hours in a day? This is for all of you. I have hit, I think everyone, has everyone raised their hand at least once? Yeah. Fabulous. Okay. What are our goals and objectives this evening? Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we are going to talk about, and I'm also going to talk briefly about what we're not going to talk about um, and the reasons, reasons why. Okay. I'm going to go over some basic anatomy and biomechanics of the spine. Um, I'd like when everybody to, leaves to be able to describe what normal posture is, okay. and generally why deviations from that normal tend to precipitate pain. Um, and then describe some, some strategies. This is one of the, the slides that you split. That's why I'm a little lost. Okay. Describe strategies for avoiding back pain with common static or sustained postures. Okay. Strategies for avoiding back pain with common dynamic or lifting postures. Demonstrate exercises effective in the prevention of back pain and the promotion of good posture. Okay. What are we not going to talk about? Not gonna, you're going to notice a conspicuous absence of specific information to specific disease and specific injury. And we aren't going to spend a great deal of time talking about herniated discs. We aren't going to spend a great deal of time talking about osteoarthritis. Is it because I don't know things about that? No. Does it apply to a smaller segment of the population? Potentially. Does posture apply to everyone, and is it an underlying cause to most of those disease processes and mechanical back pain? Yes. So that's where we really want to focus. Okay. If you have specific questions regarding some of those disease processes, um, I can answer them at the end. That reminds me, there's something I was supposed to do at the beginning. Cindy's going, yes, there was. You have a line sheet somewhere in your packet. One of the things that we've found um, people have questions as we go. As a speaker, I really don't mind stopping and answering those, but what we've found is that generally our speakers say, 
Yes, that's two slides from now. Just hang on. Okay. So if you have questions, jot them down. We'll try and save time at the end to do a quick um, question and answer session. Um, if it's something we don't get in in the scope of time that we have this evening, I can say after you can give me a call, you can give me an email. Okay, any of those is fine. Let me push the right button. Okay, shock and awe part of the presentation. Just because I kind of like statistics. It's inherent to my name, stats. Okay. Um, I, just, I, I just like thinking about some of these things because it, it it kind of takes you back when you consider some of the numbers. This one's pretty well known. 80% of all Americans suffer from back pain at some point in their lifetime. But then they get even a little bit more awe-inspiring. Back pain is the fifth most common cause for all physician visits and account for more than 6 million ER and physician visits annually. Wow. Second only to upper respiratory infections is the cause for missed work. And let me qualify before we go any further. Back pain. Sorry, back pain. We're not necessarily talking about just the low back. What if I said back and cervical pain every time we talked about back pain? We'd be here for another hour. So we're encompassing neck to tailbone, OK? <clears throat> this is some important government agency or grant, I'm sure, the MEPS. Estimated that the direct, and this is, these are $19.98, okay, that the direct cost of back pain annually, $26 million. Billion. Billion dollars. Sorry. Misplaced my decimal point. Okay. It doesn't count indirect costs, lost wages, lost productivity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. This is the one that really got me. It's the third most expensive disorder okay, in terms of health care dollars spent behind cancer and heart disease. It's back pain. Okay. The other fact that I didn't put up there was that then in the medical world, it's a bit of an enigma. Okay. You come in with shoulder pain, knee pain, hip pain. We can generally diagnose it and tie it to a specific pathomechanical dysfunction. Back pain, we give people a diagnosis 20% of the time. Okay. So why the epidemic? Okay. Because posture is the common denominator to every functional activity. You are always using your spine for something. Even when you are sitting, even when you are lying down, if we register EMG activity, in any static position that you feel you are resting, you are using something from here to here to maintain that alignment. Okay. Illustration. Everybody sit with your hand out. If you have something in front of you, if not, you can try it later. Put your hand out on the table in front of you. Okay. Put your other hand, fingertips, on your abdominal muscles here. Okay. Sit up nice and tall and press down on the table with your hand. Okay, whichever hand you have on the table. Feel your abdominals contract. Okay. You're pushing and, and you're creating counterforce. If you push down against the table with no counterforce in your abdominals, you're going to bend backwards. So pushing open doors, pulling open doors, any static or dynamic position you can think of, you are using your trunk to stabilize in some way. Okay. So the spine is always performing work, right? And as I tell my patients all the time, there's a larger margin for error for using your back incorrectly. And over the course of time, we generally begin using our trunks inappropriately, okay? Our bodies from here to here and here to here are designed to be the stable base of support with which we are generating force here and here, okay? Force and velocity and ballistic movements should come from our limbs, okay? This should be the stable base of support, okay? If we begin losing strength, flexibility to apply those proper positions, we have to rely on something else and we begin misusing our trunk. We start using this part of our body to generate force and velocity. 
okay? But the margin for error is greater, okay? There's a couple things that happen with back pain, all right? First of all, okay, there tends to be a little bit, there's a cumulative effect, first of all, okay? We can misuse that body part for a period of time and get away with it, okay? Then lots of times there's also a bit of a delayed effect, okay? And I tell my, my back patients this all the time, okay? You put your finger on a hot stove, you're going to pull it back right away and say, ouch, that hurt. Okay? Your brain can pretty easily put together that it was putting your finger on that hot stove that made it hurt. Back pain often goes a little bit more like this. And then it hurts from putting your finger on the stove. Okay? So as a result of some of those factors, human beings are slow learners. Okay. Sometimes it takes a period of time for that to catch up with us. Okay. We can get away with the, the misuse for a period of time. Okay. So think of correcting your posture to back pain as hand washing is to the common cold. Okay. It's one of the best defenses that we have. Okay. We can't always prevent accidents. We can't always prevent having jobs that require us to be in static positions for a prolonged period of time or having jobs that require that we lift a significant amount of weight. But what we do have within our control is applying good posture, okay, and postural positions to those functional activities, okay? What is posture? Well, posture can be defined any one of a number of ways. I picked the one I like the best, um, the average orientation of the body parts over time. Then you have to ask, well, what's normal, okay? We in therapy will sometimes use a plumb line test, okay? Um, it gets complicated. It's kind of hard to do. We get used to looking at posture frequently enough. And when, when you come see me as a patient, we don't look at your posture just when you have back pain. We look at your posture when you have foot pain. We look at your posture when you have shoulder pain, okay? We aren't going to get into the reasons why posture here begins to affect all those other structures. But, okay, everybody gets a postural screen. So we get pretty used to looking at it, and we get pretty used to seeing those deviations and kind of, but let's talk a little bit for just a second or two about what normal actually is, okay? Generally speaking, if you look at someone, okay, from the side, you should see that the holes of their ears line up directly over the tips of their shoulders, tips of their shoulders directly over the greater trochanter of the hip, which is that pointy thing right there, okay? That's directly over the knee, and the knee is just anterior, just forward. Let me use my little pointy thing. See that line comes down, and it's just forward to the ankle, okay? We will sometimes tell patients when you are assessing your own posture that if you stand with your heels up against a wall, and the back of your head up against a wall, and your butt and your shoulders touch, this is proper posture, okay? And then step away from the wall, right? Proper posture requires the least amount of muscular activity to maintain, but over the course of time with inflexibility, adaptive shortening, things like that, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, it becomes more and more difficult. And what we generally see Okay, lots of different postural syndromes that we see when they begin to cause problems is a flattening of the lumbar lordosis, okay? Everybody knows that person whose Levi's look like they're going to fall off their backside, okay? So the lumbar lordosis flattens, okay? We see a flattening of the cervical lordosis, a forward posture of the head, rounded shoulders, and an increased thoracic kyphosis. We'll talk about what all those words mean in just a second, okay? But that's quickly how you can screen your own posture. Can you get into that position and have all of those things touch? If you can, you're roughly in line with the, the plumb line test that we use. Two basic, two other little definitions. I've, I've already used them, just the difference between static positioning and dynamic positioning or dynamic postures. Um, static position, you are all in a static position right now. I'm somewhere between the two. I stop moving for a second or two, and then I fidget around because of that thing over in the corner. I'd take twice as many of all of you 
to not have to talk to that, but I have to talk to that, and so that's why I fidget. Okay? So I'm somewhere between static and dynamic postures right now. Okay? Um, lifting, pushing, pulling, squatting, um, carrying, those are dynamic postures. Okay? Positions that you are moving. Okay? What risk factors can we identify generally to back pain? A few of the usual offenders, we aren't going to talk very much about them. Uh, this is not a weight loss um, presentation. It is not a smoking cessation presentation. But I have to tell you, those things are bad for you. Stop doing them if you do them. Okay? Think about this. Think about the tissue quality, if you will. Sorry if any of you are vegetarians and this bothers you. Think about the tissue quality of jerky or ham versus steak or chicken. And if you smoke, you're going to have jerky and ham. Those tissues are not very elastic. They don't have very good recovery properties. And if you don't smoke, you have steak or chicken. You really want to be steak or chicken. Stop doing that stuff. Okay? Obesity changes the body mechanics or changes the biomechanics of the spine. Okay? We'll talk a little bit in a few minutes about dynamic postures and keeping weight close to you. Well, if we have more weight, particularly in our midsection, it moves further from our center of gravity, and we have to create more counterforce in our low back to accommodate for that. Okay? Again, a little bit outside the scope of the presentation tonight, but I did want to mention them because I would be negligent if I didn't. Okay? Lower socioeconomic status, we can spend two hours talking about all the factors that that creates. Um, we won't. Sedentary lifestyles, okay? None of us are as physically active as we should be. Here are the two we're going to spend our time talking about this evening, okay? Physically demanding heavier work activities, poor dynamic postures when we are performing those tasks, okay? Prolonged static positioning, poor static postures, okay? All right. We're going to spend a few minutes going over the anatomy, the biomechanics of the spine. Um, I'm not going to talk, I guess I've said, we are going to talk in depth about a couple of things here in a few minutes. I've said several times, we're going to talk in depth about this topic, okay? Um, the spine is a complicated structure, okay? There are a lot of pieces, parts shoved into a very small amount of area. When I'm treating my patients and we start talking about their back and how it works and what it should be doing and what it can't do, I tell them that, you know, this to me is a 25-piece puzzle, this is a 50-piece puzzle, and this is like a 500-piece puzzle. Okay? It doesn't necessarily make them harder to fix in my world. You just have to look at them with a slightly different perspective. So we're just going to hit the highlights of what is in there because it will give you a greater understanding of how altered postural forces compromise their function if you know what's in there and what it should be doing. So at a glance, we have the bony anatomy. Okay? We have 33 vertebrae. This is for the next time you play Trivial Pursuit. Okay? Seven are cervical, 12 are thoracic, five are lumbar, five sacral, four coccygeal. Okay? Cervical spine is anywhere from the base of your skull to your seventh cervical vertebrae. Okay? Thoracic spine is anywhere that a rib is attached. It's the easiest way to remember that. It's the midsection of your spine here. Lumbar spine, okay? about where your belt is or where your belt should be. Okay? Um, the sacrum and the coccygeal vertebrae are actually fused. Your sacrum is a fused piece of tri fused triangular shaped bone. Okay? Excuse my backside. It's at about the spot where you top, stop tucking in a shirt, okay? right about there. Okay. And the um, coccygeal vertebrae are generally, people call it your tailbone. Fall on it and you know it. Okay. Um, there is a central canal okay, that the spinal cord runs through throughout the course, the, the length of the, uh, let me point it out on this side because my pointer only works on that screen if I point over there. And that's where your spinal cord runs through from the base of your skull all the way down. There are interlocking facet joints. This protuberance here, okay, 
interlocks with the one above it, I'm sorry, the one below it, they kind of look like this, okay? And it's where we create some of the stability, but it's also the only spot in the spine where we really get movement is at, and we call those the facet joints, okay? That's where we actually create that movement. In the lumbar spine, it generally creates flexion and extension this way. Thoracic spine is where we get most of our rotation. Cervical spine at different segments give us both because we obviously get a good amount of rotation here, flexion, and extension and side bending. It's part of why the neck is so much, is so at risk because we have so many different planes of motion, okay? Ligaments generally hold bone to bone. They are mildly elastic connective tissues, okay? They are the check reins of a joint. Um, everybody's heard of an anterior cruciate ligament. 37 football players per week tear their ACL, okay? Create stability in the joint, 37, not really, but a lot, okay? You have some of those same structures in your spine. They help to, it, they help to create stability, okay? Um, too many to name, okay? There's a lot in there. Intervertebral discs, this is like the, um, This poor guy gets all the blame for everything in the back, okay? It is a structure, there is, a, there is an intervertebral disc between every level of vertebrae, all the way from the top to the bottom. You can see them here, they're kind of those translucent, um, darker shaded, except for between C1 and C2. Somebody knows that out there and you're gonna critique me on that when I say that there's a disc. I know who it is too, okay? There is no disc between C1 and C2. Okay, the discs are there to serve as shock absorbers and spacers, okay? Um, you will hear people give you an analogy that disc material is kind of like a jelly donut. I don't like that analogy. It's really much more like a water balloon, okay? If you squeeze a water balloon, okay, it's gonna pooch out the top and it's gonna pooch out the bottom. It's gonna make those sounds when it does, okay? But if you release it, it's gonna come back to its normal shape, okay? A jelly donut, if you squeeze the insides out and you let go of the inside, it's not gonna get sucked back in, okay? Discs are really more like water, or yes, really more like water balloons, okay? They are there to be a little bit of a cushion, okay? But they also create space, okay? This is my friend Slim. He accompanies me and helps me most every day, okay? If, and I don't know if you can see this, there are small holes here, okay? They're in between every level of vertebrae. They get bigger towards the lumbar spine. We call them foramina, because we have to have fancy names for everything. It's basically a hole, okay? And in this foramina escapes a nerve root. We'll talk about those guys in just a second. If we were to collapse this disc, which starts to happen with age, okay? Um, if we were to collapse this disc, I hope everybody can imagine that those two vertebrae get closer together. And there becomes more play between them, okay? Because we've taken away that spacer, taking up that room, okay? So that's often where we end up with an unstable spine with advancing ages and the loss of disc height because there's more play between them, okay? Too many to name. Muscular support of the spine, okay? Sometimes they're inconspicuous. Again, it probably surprised at least a couple people to push down on the table and feel their abdominals contract, okay? You think you're generally using your arm for that motion, and you're not, you're using your trunk. So basically anything from here to here, front and back, and sides is stabilizing the spine. It was convenient that when I put the picture in the presentation, oops, oop, wrong button. Got a little carried away. That all of these names of all of these muscles came out blurry because we don't need to talk about all of them. There are a ton of them in there, okay? Including your abdominals, probably one of the most important muscles for stabilizing the spine isn't even attached to the spine but I already gave you an illustration of that, okay? Nerve roots. 
we have to have sensation come from these guys and these guys to our brain to give us information. We have to have information flow from our brain to our limbs to move, okay? Um, receive and send information. It's the electrical system of the body, okay? Those nerve roots escape through those foramina, okay? One at each level, uh, vertebrae to innervate trunk and limbs, okay? They have to have adequate space to do that. Nerve tissue does not like to be pinched, rubbed, swollen around, or otherwise looked at funny because they begin to misfire. It's a very um, picky tissue in the body. Um, so that's why they are worth mentioning. And again, if you imagine taking this spacer out here, okay, that space collapses and the room that you have for that nerve root to escape becomes less. Moving quickly from anatomy to the biomechanics, there are a couple just basic concepts um, to understand before we go on. Three naturally occurring spinal curves, length tension relationships, force transference, and sustained loading or creep. Sounds horrible, but we all do it. Okay. I already used the terminology lordosis and kyphosis. It's the names that we give to each of those curves. They are, everybody thinks curvature of the spine is a bad thing. It's not, okay? It has to be there. We scramble our brains with every step that we take, okay? Cervical lordosis is a slight forward curve. So for you, it would be a backward C, is that right? Or forward C? Backward C, thank you. Thoracic kyphosis is a forward C for you, okay? Lumbar lordosis, same direction as the cervical spine, okay? Why are they there? They are there to be shock absorbers. Cindy was laughing at my audio visual aid, okay? Two paper clips, shock absorbing, get a little bit of spring in there. Very little shock absorption, okay? If we walk around on a spine like this in about six hours time, none of us would be able to think because we would scramble our brains. That force would be transferred all the way up that structure and absorbed inside our heads. That would be kind of a bad thing, okay? So that's what the spinal curves are there to do. Link tension relationships, think of it this way. Muscles, as a general rule, like, if we can give them a personality, they like to do their work at a certain length and up on a certain amount of tension. If they are asked to consistently perform their work in an elongated position to that length tension relationship, they can do that for a period of time, okay? And then they will begin to fail under the tensile forces, okay? Or in a shortened range of motion, in other words, when a muscle becomes inflexible, okay? One is generally strength related, elongation. Shortening usually means we have an inflexible muscle. But just remember, muscles like to perform their work in an optimal position. They can work outside of that both directions, and they, they do in the normal course of their activity, but not consistently at each of those end ranges. Okay? Force transference, the best way I can describe this is that your call be answered by the next available representative. Everybody's heard that. Okay? I hate it when that happens. Okay? There is a hierarchy of force absorption, okay? When we apply a force to the human body, it is initially absorbed by your strength, okay? It's absorbed by muscle tissue. If you are not strong enough to absorb that force, it's gonna move to the tendinous complex of that muscle, okay? Up the chain one higher is gonna be the ligamentous tissue that supports that structure or that joint, okay? And after that, the bony tissue. Okay. Don't want to get to that point. You want to be strong enough that you're absorbing those forces with your strength. Okay. Sustained loading or creep. I was trying to come up with a really fun example of this, and I couldn't. Okay. So we'll just look at the definition. When soft tissues are exposed to sustained force in the same direction without an eruption, further movement occurs. Okay. 
So if we apply a stretch to a tissue and then maintain it for a long period of time, the tissue will continue to move that direction. Okay? It is problematic because it squeezes water out of those tissues. Okay? Um, it rearranges the collagen in those tissues. And if it's released in a certain amount of time, okay, your tissue will recover. It will come back to its, its normal shape. Okay? Um, but over the course of time, it is, if it is sustained or maintained, it stays in that elongated position. And then you're subject to fatigue failure, stress failures okay, in that tissue. Okay, so let's start talking a little bit about um, the practical application. Yes, doing good on time. Okay, kind of the practical application of this. We're going to talk a little bit first okay, about dynamic postures. I'm going to give you just a little bit of some anecdotal information that I hear in the clinic all the time. Okay. Um, what are the four biggest barriers to me doing my job and treating my patients to either prevent back pain or get them over about a back pain? Well, the first is awareness. Okay? People don't often know what proper body mechanics are. We take care of that with education, like tonight. No one should leave and not know what proper body mechanics are. Okay? Number two is one of my favorites, perception of impact. You're minimizing your exposure. Think of it like this. You go out on that nice first spring day, you work in the yard all day long, and you come in and you are sunburned to a crisp. You didn't put on sunscreen. Two weeks later, you're going to go back out and work in the yard. Would you ever for a second stop and say, well, I got sunburned two weeks ago. I'm not going to put any sunscreen on today. No, of course not. Okay? You're minimizing your exposure. I have had patients, stubborn patients, that say, you just don't understand my job. I can't use good body mechanics. And they are describing one small portion of their job. If they would take all the elements of their job that they can apply good body mechanics and dynamic lifting postures, they're minimizing their exposure. Why wouldn't you put sunscreen on two weeks from now just because you got sunburned two weeks ago? Okay. So don't minimize their impact. Willingness to change their habits. That's really the biggest barrier we have. I hear this all the time. Um, it takes me too long to apply good body mechanics. I don't have time to move that slowly. Okay. Taking a load here and putting it here doesn't take any more time to do it this way than it does to do it this way. You have to have the willingness to change. What slows people down is changing the habit. It's not the movement pattern itself. Okay? So yes, for a period of time, if you're going to improve your lifting mechanics, if you're going to improve your work positions, it's going to take you a little bit longer. In the long run, those movement patterns don't take any more time. Okay. And then the strength and the flexibility to apply proper technique. We'll talk about that. We're going to have, at, at the end, I'm going to demonstrate some basic exercises for healthy backs that will help maintain some of those things. Okay. All right. So what are some basic components? Here's how, and again, much of my time in the last um, 20 years, may as well call it 20 years at this point, has been spent in industrial rehab. I've been out in industry with people that have crazy heavy jobs. Um, some of the riskiest ones are in healthcare, nurses and nursing assistants, terribly risky jobs, highest rate of, of injuries. I've seen more um, nurses' aides injured at their jobs than guys that lift, sorry, excuse me, and women that lift 80 pound bags of concrete all day. Okay? Um, human beings are notoriously hard to material handle, and it's because we are unpredictable and we don't have handles. Okay? Patients will get halfway through a transfer with us, and they decide they're going to help more or they're going to help less, and we can't grab things on their way down. Material handling people is difficult. Some of these rules don't really apply there. Okay? 
um, or they decide they're going to fight against you. Um, so most safety committee meetings in industry go like this. Come in, welcome, have a donut, have some coffee, sit down. Lift with your legs, not with your back. Ready, break. They're gone. It's a little bit more complicated than that. It's not a lot. We'll go through it. Okay. Um, so some general guidelines for lifting techniques. Test your load before you lift it. I see more people get hurt because the load that they anticipated isn't the load that they had. Let me give you an illustration. Everyone has been at a party, beverage of choice. I'm not going to impose upon you the kind of beverage that you were drinking. But it's in a can, and you can't see it. You set yours down. You walk away. You come back. You think you pick up the one that belongs to you, but you pick up your friends who took seven large gulps and set it down, and there's this much left in the can. Now, what happens when you grab that emptier can of the two? Well, you practically throw it over your shoulder. Why is that? Because your brain is presetting the amount of force it thinks it's going to need in grip strength, in amount of controlled bicep contraction to lift that to your mouth in a slow, controlled manner. If that amount is different than what your brain's anticipating, you got the wrong amount of force. Okay? This box in our clinic can weigh 10 pounds and it can weigh 100 pounds because we're sneaky and we do things like that. Tonight it just weighs 10 pounds. Okay? Your wife asks you to pick up that box of sweaters in the closet and take it to the Goodwill. She doesn't tell you that there's 17 pairs of shoes in the bottom of it. You're going to get hurt doing that. Okay? So always test your load. That doesn't need to be complicated. Taking the edge of it, scooting it, pushing, pulling, tugging on it just a little bit, it will give your brain an idea of where you need to be. Okay? The famous one, lift with your legs, not with your back. Why is that? Well, again, we're designed from here to here to create stability, okay? be a stable base of support. We are designed here and here to generate power. Okay? Cross-sectional area of a muscle determines how much force it can produce. If we take all the muscles, not counting our guts in the middle, okay? if we take all the muscles of our trunk, we bunch them all together, we look at their cross-sectional area, we're talking about a small sapling. About yay big. Okay? If we take the cross-sectional area of our, our glutes, our quads, our hamstrings, okay? we bunch them all together, we're talking about a trunk about, or a tree about yay big. Which one's going to generate more force? This one, not this one. Don't use this tree, it'll break. Okay? So, lift with your legs, not with your back. We're going to do a bit of a demonstration here when I don't have to operate more things than one. Okay? Maintain your lumbar lordosis. That slight forward curve that you have in your low back needs to be there throughout the lifting cycle. It is the only way that we load the spine equally. Okay? When we start bringing weight out forward from us, we're creating an increased load on the anterior structures of the spine, well, and the posterior for that matter. Okay? Keep your head and your chest up. Whatever your eyes are doing is what your low back is going to do. Okay? If we begin to look down, we're going to begin to lean forward, okay? and we're going to lose that lumbar lordosis. Maintain a wide base of support. Okay? A triangle cannot fall over if it is lying on its longest side. Makes sense. Okay? Um, we have to exert some amount of postural control in our trunk as we move a weight, okay? And the wider our base of support, the less effort we have to put forth in just maintaining ourselves upright, okay? To keep ourselves from falling over, basically. Okay, keep weight close to your center of mass, okay? If I hold 10 pounds in here, okay? It's 10 additional pounds of counterforce that I have to come up with in my low back to maintain that position. Thus, the, the comment we were talking about about body weight and obesity. Okay? If I take that same 10 pounds, though, and I hold that weight at arm's length, that's 100 additional pounds of counterforce just because of the length of the lever of my arm. Okay? 
I don't want to hold it there anymore because it's hard. Okay? So keep weight close to your center of mass. The, your center of mass is right behind your belt. Okay? Too many things to operate. Always face your load. Never twist with weight in your hands. It's like wringing out a dish rag. Okay? Again, it doesn't need to be complicated. You don't have to move like a robot. It's as simple as pivoting, okay, with your feet so that your toes are pointing in the direction that you're going to set a weight down, okay? Okay, let me pause here for just a minute and show you what a good lifting technique looks like, okay? A couple other things I kind of want to add because I neglected to put them in the um, slides, okay? So, and I'll do this kind of multiple directions so that everybody can see me. Can everybody at least get a, can you see me even if you can't see the box? Okay. So, those common principles put into action, okay. Wide basis support, head and chest up, keep my lumbar lordosis, okay. My rear end is the first thing that goes down towards the ground. It's the last thing to come up, okay. So. Whether I am lifting from here or here or the floor, those principles all apply. Okay? I can see what's, I can see Jenny hanging out over there. Okay? I can see what is in front of me. I have my lumbar lordosis. Okay? I pick it up. Right? Setting things back down, still same rules. I will have people lift in the clinic and they look beautiful. And I ask them to set it back down, they go like this. Those are the same forces, just in reverse, okay? All right. Split load carries, those are basically people that carry toolboxes, paint buckets, things like that, okay? But it's bags of groceries. Don't just think about your work activities, okay? Same basic principles apply to lifting. May be beneficial to equally divide the load, okay? So people, again, will look fabulous in what we call a, a front lift and carry, okay? Then I ask them to do a split load carry and they go like this, okay? Same basic principles apply. Your wide base of support is now front to back, okay? Head and chest up. Here, pick it up. Unless it's a small child, you don't need to look at it to pick it up because it's not going to move, okay? People who do split load carries all day, every day, lots of times I will recommend to them, if they're electricians or painters, I recommend to them that they carry a load on each side that's lighter than carry one on one side that's heavier. Okay? All right. Tandem and team lifts, moving the sofa, moving the entertainment center, there's a big difference between one, two, three, lift, and one, two, lift on three. Make sure you clearly communicate. If you've ever been the one to have back pain, okay, make sure you're the one in charge of deciding which one that is and be clear on it before you do it. Okay? Because that fraction of a second is just long enough for somebody to get hurt. Okay. Pushing and pulling technique. This is the only thing I could figure out to, and I'm not going to pull this cabinet over. Okay? As a general rule, if you're presented with the option, push, okay, you're less likely to assume yucky postures when you, when you push than when you pull, okay. Principles are the same. You want wide base of support, okay. If I'm going to pull this cabinet towards me, you want a wide base of support, you want to use your legs, okay. If I'm going to pull this towards me, my arms are going to be in close to my side, I'm going to use my body weight to come back with it. Not like this. This is where people get in trouble with pulling. The other thing they tend to do is pulling pallets and carts and things like that behind them because they end up in rotation and doing this at the same time, okay? Pushing is better because you can get here, okay? Like you're doing an offensive blocking drill if you're a football player, okay? Head and chest up and drive with your legs. Sometimes moving heavy furniture, you can even get up against something. I move furniture around my house like this all the time. My husband will come home and say, how did you move that 400 pound piece of whatever. When you get down against it this way and push it that way, okay, 
good body mechanics that way. All right. Ha. Special circumstances. Anybody shoveled snow lately? <laughs> Had to throw that one in there. Everybody asked me, how do I do that? I don't have a shovel. We'll make my long two by two here make do. Okay. Wide base of support. Bend in the knees, head and chest up. Get your hand down as close to the blade as you can. Here, use your legs to pick it up. Don't, if you need to, the best thing to do is push it to where you want it. Bend down, pick it up. When it's that nice light snow, you can do that. Not this. Okay. If you need to throw it because you can't, it's too heavy to push it that distance, you need to throw it forward. Okay? And in small chunks, right, with the heavier snow. Vacuuming. That's proper body mechanics. Okay? Because you're not doing this. You got the worst of all of those. You got flexion, you have rotation, all kind of mixed in there together. Okay. Golfers lift for light objects. Okay. Very light objects. Phil Mickelson, my husband's favorite golfer because he's left-handed. Okay. Doesn't tee up his ball. Okay. By bending over, he doesn't tee up his ball by squatting, which we'd be, we would say was good body mechanics. He takes his hand, he puts it out on the end of his driver, he kicks one leg behind him, and he squats and he tees up his ball. Okay. You're creating a little bit of a counter force. It helps you maintain your lumbar lordosis. You can only do that with fairly light objects. Okay. It's a friend of mine demonstrating poor posture. Oops, I did it again. Poor posture, good lifting posture. I've kind of shown you all those things. Static postures. Are we really resting when we're sitting? The answer is no. I'll answer that question for you. Your inner discal pressure in your lumbar spine is 40% higher when you are sitting than when you're standing. Let me briefly explain the bowling ball head syndrome. That is, I, I, I came up with that one myself. The physics of holding our head up are pretty remarkable, as it is. This thing weighs 12 pounds, thereabouts. Some of us, they're heavier. Um, some of us, they're not. And we support that on um, the surface area of a, about a nickel, okay? Maybe a nickel, maybe a dime on each side, okay? Not to mention the fact that the center of mass of our head is offset to that support structure, okay? Center of mass of our head is somewhere behind the bridge of our nose. It's right between our ears. It's right above the roof of our mouth. We have to hold it on the top of that stick and not let it fall over. You can't drop a bowling ball, okay? So the center of mass of our head sits forward to its support structure. If I take an amount of mass that's out here and what I'm supporting it with is back here, what's going to happen to it? It's going to fall. Okay, so over the course of time, we have to work really hard through our posterior cervical musculature to hold our bowling ball up. What happens? It begins to creep forward. Well, if we take that center of mass and we push it further away from the thing we're trying to support it on, it becomes even harder to do. So you see that this becomes sort of a self-reinforcing. And we see that all the time in the clinic. People walk in and they're like this. And they say, my neck hurts. Well, yes, your neck hurts. And the first thing we have to do is get this guy back over its support structure so you don't have to work so hard to hold up your bowling ball. This is particularly prevalent in um, seated postures. 75% of all work in Western countries is done in a sitting position. So let's look at normal posture. And we're going to talk with static positioning. We're going to talk more about the, the implement, the, the things that we interact with um, because we have so many other pieces of equipment we have to, to consider. Okay? So neck position, we talked about normal posture. The holes of her ears are directly over the tips of her shoulders. Okay? Maintaining her lumbar lordosis even in a seated position. 
See that slight forward curve? Upper arms, you can describe them one of two ways. They're either perpendicular to the floor, okay, or they are parallel to her trunk, either one. Um, forearms, wrists, and hands are in a neutral position. We are here, we are here, okay. Elbows are bent roughly at 90 degrees. Upper legs, the thigh is parallel with the ground. Um, feet are on the ground and the lower leg is perpendicular to the ground. Okay. I, I want to take just a quick survey. We have about 10 minutes left. After I am going to, um, when I'm done with this, I'm going to talk about some general therapeutic exercise for a healthy population um, to help prevent some of these things. Um, by a show of hands, does anybody need to leave right at that 8 o'clock mark? Because I will probably not be done. If there's something that you need to head out to do, um, you're not going to bother me at all. If you need to go, though, use that exit so that you're not walking in front of the camera. Um, so it, please don't hesitate to get up and go if you, if you need to, or if I'm just getting that boring. I, un I understand. Okay. Um, so what things can we, and in your packet, Cindy has included a guideline from the OSHA website, okay, that gives you some more specific information about chairs, keyboards, monitors, etc. We're just going to kind of talk generally about them. Um, most important thing we need to consider is your chair position, okay, and, and the, uh, the flexibility and adjustability that it, it needs to have, okay. Um, the backrest needs to be adjustable both fore and aft. It needs to go both forward and backward because when we are sitting in our chairs, us sh some shorter people, okay, if we have to be able to sit with our rear ends all the way against the back of the chair and still have our feet flat on the floor. Well, that doesn't happen for everybody, okay? So if you, the more important thing is to get your rear end scooted back to the back of the chair. Well, if that takes your feet off the floor, we need to bring the backrest forward, okay? That's one way that we can adjust that. The seating pan is basically the name for this part of your chair that part of your chair, okay? When you are seated in your chair okay, and your rear end is up against the backrest, you should be able to put your fist between the edge of the chair and the back of your knee, okay? If, if you're up against the front of the chair like this, your seating pan is too deep front to back, okay? If you're off the edge of it and dangling, especially if it's a sharp edge and it allows your knees to hang lower than your hips, you need a deeper seating pan, okay? There's also importance in the width of the seating pan, okay? If the seating pan is too narrow or it's built up on the sides, like the seats in you know, some sports cars, it kind of tends to put us into a position like this, okay? And that tends to create a lot of hip inflexibility that becomes problematic over time. Okay, so wide enough seating pan. Okay. The armrest height needs to be adjustable up and down and preferably in and out as well. Okay. When we have people seated at their workstation, we want them to be able to be in a neutral, we'll talk about this with keyboards, we want them to be in a neutral position without, if, if you're up here, your armrests are too high. Okay. If you are here and they're dangling and you can't get your arms down on your armrests without slouching, they're obviously too low, okay? And obviously an adjustable height on the chair because after we make all those other adjustments, your feet still have to touch, still have to touch the floor, okay? If you make all those other adjustments and your seat fits you just fine, but your feet still don't touch the floor, put a footrest underneath your feet, okay? Bring the floor up to you. Monitor, okay? The top line of print on your monitor should be right at eye level, okay? Your monitor should be 20 to 40 inches away from you, okay? And it needs to be directly in front of you, all right? Sometimes you will see for space constraints, people put their monitors over there and their keyboards are here. Bad idea, okay? Monitor needs to be directly in front of you. If you work by a window, 
your monitor should be perpendicular to the window to minimize glare. If you have backlighting, it's harder to see. And if you have glare on the screen, it's obviously harder to see. So perpendicular to any light sources or overhead lights if that's a consideration. Okay. How do we cope with that with laptop use? Okay. Because my keyboard is attached to my monitor. My monitor sits down here. I can't make it at eye level. If I raise it up, we're going to talk about keyboard height in a second, it's going to be too high. Attach a wireless keyboard if you use a laptop regularly and raise the laptop up okay, so that you don't use the keyboard that's on, um, on the laptop itself. Vision correction, number of people that start to have neck pain six months after they get their bifocals because this is what they're doing all the time to see their screen. Okay? And it starts to hurt. Sometimes I will take people that have bifocals or trifocals and I will have them while they're sitting at their computer just use a single vision lens because then they can look through the middle of their lens and still see okay, without having to do that funny thing to get through the bottom part of their correction. Keyboard and other input devices Okay. They need to be close enough to you that your elbows stay by your sides, not out here. Okay. The desk gets cluttered. You put your keyboard up here and you're reaching out here like this. Okay. Height. The height of your keyboard is, should be such that if you have your hands on home row, okay, your elbow is bent to about 90 degrees and your wrists are neutral. Okay. Not here. Not here, okay, and not here. All right. Use keyboard trays when they are um, available and, and necessary. Okay. Um, and again, your keyboard should be directly in front of you, along with your monitor. Your keyboard shouldn't be over here while your monitor is in front of you. Um, in today's day and age, with all of our wireless devices, we really shouldn't be here anymore. We shouldn't even be here with that goofy extension cradle thing. Okay. Um, Hands-free headsets are great. Um, miscellaneous considerations. Wrist rests, um, sometimes they come built into the keyboard. They are meant to support your wrist here so that you don't end up doing that wrist extension thing. Again, we're a little bit outside the, the um, topic of how it affects your spine. Document holders, okay, people that do a lot of data entry, having those clipped to the monitor so that it is at eye height and you're not doing this to read text and put it into um, your computer. And then mouse design. Sometimes you see those great big mice with a tracker ball that you roll your thumb with or there's all kinds of different ones out there. Again, worth mentioning because they are in the, um, the OSHA handouts. We put it all together and we look like this. Sleep position. Anybody feel like when they wake up in the morning that they have slept like this? Another static positioning or another static posture that's important. Um, I just thought that was a funny picture actually. Okay. Again, we want to maintain neutrality. What I tell my patients is when they are asleep, I want their nose, their chin, and their Adam's apple in a straight line. Okay. If you're lying on your left side, okay, and your pillow's too thick, you're going to end up like this. Everybody thinks they have neck pain; they used to need to use more pillows. Not necessarily. Okay. So that's too thick of a pillow. If I fall down that way to hit my head on the pillow, it's too thin of a pillow. It's the same basic rule if you're a back sleeper. Okay? If you're a back sleeper, though, you're looking at those structures in this plane, not in this plane. If you're a stomach sleeper, that's really not that bad for your back. We'll talk about that with therapeutic exercise in just a second. Um, but it's terrible for your neck. So, um, so if you look at these sleeping postures, you see that her nose, her chin, and her Adam's apple are in a straight line. Okay? One of the ways... Um, and, and these are, you know, beyond the pillow thickness, there's density, your sleeping surface density, how far mattresses are designed to absorb the heaviest part of your body the furthest into the mattress. That's where you're going to sink in. Okay. 
A couple of the strengthening exercises may make you fatigued. Fatigue in our world is fine. Pain is not. Okay? So none of these exercises should ever be done to the point of pain. If you already have a condition somewhere from here to here, um, you know, I definitely recommend that you seek a, a therapist's um, input, a physician's input about those things. Don't do any of these that hurt, but I will demonstrate them for you. Okay? And we'll call it my workout for the day. Okay. Um, so on page one, we're going to start from the top and kind of work down. Get rid of slim. Cervical flexibility, two groups of muscles we want to stretch. We want to stretch three, sorry, suboccipitals, okay? Short group of little extensors up here right at the base of the skull, the upper trapezius, and the levator scapula. Okay. So the first stretch in the top left-hand corner is a levator scapula stretch. And we do have these just a smidge out of order. Okay. We also fondly refer to that as our deodorant stretch in the clinic. Okay. If I'm going to stretch my right levator scapula, I look into my left armpit like I'm checking to make sure I still smell okay. okay. That same-sided hand goes over the top of your head here. Okay and gently pulls you down a little further. Okay? If you're really tight in your levator scapula, lots of times just the weight of your head is enough to give you a stretch. And where you should feel that is right there. Okay? Cervical muscles are a little bit smaller. We don't want you holding those stretches as long. Those are generally 20 second holds. Okay? Three to five repetitions of any of these stretches. Okay? Um, Corner lean, one of the things we talked about, the adaptive tissue shortening and how muscles over time, okay, the longer you spend here, the tighter you get across the front of your chest, the tighter you get across the base of your skull. Okay. So the corner lean, the, flat, the corner stretch, okay, if you find a corner and face into it, I don't want to turn my back, okay, put one forearm on each wall, your hands directly above your elbows, okay, and then just lean into the corner with your body weight, okay? We want to keep your spine aligned. I don't like to see my patients do the turtle coming out of their shell look to try and get more motion, okay? And they get claustrophobic when they stand in the corner. I think it's a throwback to kindergarten, so they go like this, okay? Maintain neutrality at your spine and just lean in, okay? Um, one of the motions that we lose in our lumbar spine is extension because we sit so much, okay? And we do so many tasks in a bent over position where we shouldn't be doing that work, okay? Maintaining, single-handedly, maintaining lumbar extension in that available range of motion is the most important thing for overall back health, okay? The two exercises on the bottom, okay? Standing lumbar extensions, hands on your hips, just lean back. You don't need to do all this stuff. This makes you feel like you're doing more range of motion, makes you feel better about yourself, but you're not really moving your back. So you don't need to be here and you don't need to be here. That motion should all come at your back in your easily available range of motion. You don't really need to hold that position. Get up from your, your desk, do 10 or 20 lumbar extensions, okay? Another really easy way to do that at home Sometimes people have lost enough range of motion that this is really hard for them. You can do a prone press up. Okay? Easily accessible range of motion, 20 or 30 repetitions. Okay? All right, next page the repeated cervical retraction stretches out the suboccipital muscles. Those guys are right up here, right at the base of your skull. Lots of times you don't even realize that they are tight. Okay? We call it our double chin stretch. Imagine trying to look at something that's really close to your face, okay, and make a double chin. Chin doesn't go down, chin doesn't go up, okay, it goes straight back. You're trying to make those ear holes closer to being over the tops of your shoulders, okay. Two arm pull, stretches out the middle of the back. You can do it free form where you're just kind of it's like you're trying to reach for something that's in front of you that you can't bend forward to get. Okay. 
Um, you can also do that around a newel post or a pole in a basement, okay, and kind of let that pull your arms out away from you. You should feel that right through here. Okay. And then the upper trapezius stretch, okay, akin to the levator scapula stretch, except this time instead of looking down into that armpit, you're looking straight ahead and your head just goes sideways. Okay. Again, you can add a little bit of some overpressure to that. If you feel like you don't get a good enough stretch, you can go both directions. Okay. Cat and camel, again, another mid-back stretch. All right. Here, imagine somebody's, women, imagine somebody's picking you up by your bra strap. Men, I don't know what to tell you. Okay. Try and make the middle of your back touch the ceiling. Okay. And you go, can go directly from there. I have too many apparatus here. Okay into a prayer stretch. Or in yoga, it's called child's pose. Of course, I have my backside to the camera. All right, back this way. That's a mid-back stretch. You're also going to get some flexibility through your shoulders in that position. Okay. On to the lower extremities. Hamstring stretch. I'm going to use a ball. I don't recommend that. I'm a trained professional. Okay, because we don't really want you on an unstable surface for this. Okay. Sitting way out on the edge of your chair, heel of one foot on the ground, sit up tall, maintain that lumbar lordosis, and lean forward. I'm looking at the face of the clock and I'm realizing you're all here late and I appreciate that. Okay. Hold for 20 or 30 seconds. It's not this. See people stretching at the gym like this? They're really doing more of a back stretch. They aren't really doing a hamstring stretch. Okay, um, and then a kneeling hip flexor stretch. Hip flexors get tight again because we sit so much, so they sit, you're in that shortened position all the time. It looks like this, okay. On one knee, this is the side of the hip flexor that I'm stretching. Let me get up here so everybody can see. Hope I don't fall off the table. Okay, this is the hip flexor that I'm stretching. And all you need is a subtle bend in the knee here. Okay. You don't need to lean forward. You don't want to arch your back. All you want to do is bend that front knee. You'll feel a stretch right in the front of your hip flexor here and down into your quad just a little bit. Okay. All right, a few strengthening exercises. Most important muscle groups to keep strong, mid-scapular muscles. Muscles between your chicken wings back here and your mid-back. Um, several ways to do that. We can do some TheraBand exercises. I put the TheraBand over here. Again, it's the only thing I could find to attach it to. So everybody over there, forgive my backside. Okay. You can pick up TheraBand in any sporting goods section of most anywhere. Myers, Walmart, Target, all those sorts of places. You can go to Dick's too. Cost more money. Okay. Rowing. Elbows staying close to the sides, palms facing each other, and then you pinch your shoulder blades together in the back. I can bring my elbows back as far as I want to go, and I'm not going to use those muscles unless you are emphasizing making them touch on the inside edges. Okay? Shoulder extension, same motion, well, same position for the TheraBand. Okay? Bringing them back to your sides here. Okay? These may be out of order, but I know it's in there somewhere. Horizontal abduction. TheraBand between your hands this way. Hands about shoulder width apart. Pull them apart. Squeeze your shoulder blades together. Okay. Just like that. Um, reverse corner push-outs. I just like the guy in the picture. And I like his t-shirt. I'm not really sure what it says. But you can stand with your back into a corner. Elbows about shoulder height. Okay. Feet out away from the corner, and you push yourself up and out of the corner. A little hard to imagine. I don't have a good corner to use. Okay, Push yourself up and out. You make the exercise harder by moving your feet further away. You can stand on one foot. Okay. Put your arms up in this position, arms down here, all sorts of stuff. Good mid-scapular strengthening exercises. What do we do from here to here? 
Well, we don't need to do a bunch of crunches. That may come as a surprise to you. Crunches are not a functional movement pattern. They will strengthen your abdominals. They will give you a six pack. It's not how we use our trunk. We use it for stability, right? So what do we do? We do isometric exercises. Bar none, the best exercise for strengthening your trunk on this side is planks. Pretty simple, okay? They are difficult, all right? You can start on your knees. You can start on your elbows. Doing a plank on elbows eliminates the need to have a lot of chest and a lot of tricep strength. So we put you down here. We eliminate that, and you can focus on your trunk. And if you notice, okay, my hips are in line with my shoulders. Okay, I'm not down here like this. Right? I'm not up here like this. It's right there. Progress from that to your toes and hold. And I'll shake in about three seconds because that's hard. You can also do a side plank here. Work the obliques up. You can hold there. Okay. It's hard to talk and do these exercises at the same time. Strengthen the back side, okay, because we need to consider the trunk muscles on the other side. Bridging is kind of our, can I, can I roll? Probably not. Probably shouldn't do that. Let me move that, okay? So bridges look like this, okay? My back stays in the same relative position that I'm on on the table. I don't roll up this way, and I don't arch. Turn on your abdominals and your rear end muscles at the same time. When I lift, Okay. My back is in the same relative position it was here. Make it harder. Add a microphone. That'll make everything harder. Grab one of these guys. Get this at the same time you pick up your Swiss ball at Myers or Target. And do a bridge here. Okay. There are other versions for the sake of time. We won't go through them. I can do a bridge where my shoulders and my back are on the ball, and I'm lifting my hips the other way. I think that one's on there. Okay. You can do walkouts over the ball. I'm not going to do that one on the table because I will fall off. You just get into a plank position and walk out as far as you can control without arching your back. Okay. And then my all-time favorite if you've ever been a patient of mine, I've had to draw this exercise for about 15 years. And my lovely administrative assistant found a picture of it on the internet. So now I don't have to draw it anymore. All of my future patients will be thankful. I will show you this one because this is a great exercise. Everybody remember the exercise in phys ed when you were a kid where you take that little wheel that had the handles on the side and you'd bend over? And you try and roll it out as far as you could roll it and how hard that was. That's fine, and it's a good abdominal strengthening exercise. But we don't start in a neutral spine because you're already starting bent over. Okay? This exercise, you start up tall with your hands on this side of a TheraBall, okay? Swiss ball, stability ball. You roll the ball forward to the point of your control, and then you pull it back. You don't ever go with trunk stabilization exercises. You never go to a point where you compromise your form. If you can control it to here and your abs kick on, you say, oh, that's hard. That's as far as you go. Because if you go here, you're going to lose that control. You're going to lose that neutrality. And you're going to fall forward. Okay. Um, After all that, I've kept track of my pointer and everything else. I wanted to share this with you. Everybody take a second to read that. This is really not what physical therapists are like. I don't need any comments from the peanut gallery to my left about whether that is true or not. Physical therapy is indeed a very um, efficacious modality when all of these things have gotten to the point that you cannot self-manage them. Okay? Um, we have two excellent therapists um, on staff. I'm very well versed in, in treating back pain. 
Um, there are things that we can do to undo some of these things when prevention is, when, when prevention is past tense. Okay. Needed to throw this in there. When do you need to see a doctor? Okay. When do you not wait? Okay. Numbness or tingling of arms, hands, legs, or feet, especially if it's occurring on both sides at the same time. Hate to end on this because it's kind of like a, it's kind of pessimistic. Weakness in the limbs, again, especially if it's bilateral. Your back pain is accompanied by a fever. Okay. Oh, real important one, changes in bowel and bladder habits. Okay. Urgency, retention, constipation, all that sort of stuff. Don't mess around with calling your physical therapist. Call your doctor. Um, unexplained weight loss, pain that's more than 10 days duration, or if you have a history of cancer or osteoporosis. Thank you so much for indulging me with the extra 20 minutes. I hope it was helpful. Um, I hope it was educational. Um, I appreciate your time. Um, let's open it up quickly to any questions. Again, if you need to skeet daddle. Um, thank you so much for coming. Stay warm.